it's nice to at least see from a distance many friends. Uh, I'm I'm very sorry I'm not there with you, although it's it's not so hot here as it is in Hungary right now. So I'm a little more comfortable than you are. Let me let me flip over to the the uh, the talk now, and let's see how this works. Okay, well, as, as Janos said, um, the, the title of, of the new book with Sal Augusta is Autumn in the Anthropocene. Um, and I, I, what I'm going to do is just quickly run through the major uh, sections of that book, in a sense, give you what we see as, as the bottom line. What we're offering in this book is one particular perspective, that is the perspective from <laughs> biology about how we might cope with the mess that that uh, that human beings have created for themselves. So the first thing we start off with is asking how bad is it really? And it from 1896 when Svante Arrhenius first provided uh, a set of calculations saying that at that time, if industrial emissions continued at current pace by 2100, the world's atmosphere would have warmed three degrees Celsius. And that tended to be the expectation until about 2014, when um, a large study by the Melbourne uh, Institute, Sustainable Studies Institute, uh, came to the startling conclusion that in fact, uh, the, the big crunch, the big, problem time for, for humanity would not occur in 2100, but what rather would occur in 2050. Now, since that time, not only have we realized that the rate of climate change is increasing, uh, but we've had a number of unanticipated additional complications. So for example, in 2019, uh, although it's not officially recognized until February of 2020, but beginning in September 2019, we had the COVID pandemic and additional deaths around the world as a result of mismanaging the pandemic and public health systems being unprepared. In 2022, the pandemic continues. Additional uh, pandemics are emerging, such as monkeypox. And in addition to that, we have war going on. And in 2023, the combination of the pandemic and the war and the unpreparedness of the world economic system to cope with these realities is likely to lead to widespread famine. So by the end of 2023, we're likely to have all what we call the four horsemen of the apocalypse all in action at the same time. So it may be that 2050 is actually a little bit optimistic about uh, the timing on the big existential crunch uh, for humanity, at least technological humanity. So our perspective is that humanity, technological humanity can survive what's coming at it, at us, but we need new guidelines, uh, partly because we've not recognized that nine, about 12,500 years ago, human beings began to change their behavior from an evolutionary to socioeconomic trajectory. Now, Darwinian evolution is based on a number of, of basic concepts, one of which is that un, unlimited growth is pathological. That's why there's natural selection. This un, unlimited growth is a built-in feature of biology, but it left to its own devices, it's pathological. That's why we have natural selection as an emergent property. But we have to understand that natural selection is what we call a blunt instrument. It's not very fine-tuned. It just kills things if there are too many of them. Survival in a Darwinian uh, world requires not just conflict, but conflict resolution. The conflict without resolution is death. So along with pathological unlimited growth, conflict without resolution is a bad thing. And finally, Darwinian evolution is based on the recognition that necessity is not the mother of invention. We do not save ourselves in a crisis. In fact, when there's a crisis, necessity is the mother of trying to cope 
with the new situation based on what you already had at hand, running away from the situation if you can't cope with it, and if you can't run away, then you die. That's why I refer to natural selection as a blunt instrument. Now, about 9,000 years ago, that's the when we date the beginning of the Anthropocene, the, the setting the stage for the Anthropocene started about 12,500 years ago. But about 9,000 years ago, we have the, the emergence of the Anthropocene. Uh, Rise of the War Machines is the title of a, a brilliant article, recent article by a group of, of paleoanthropologists uh, in the Complexity Hub in, in Vienna. And the Anthropocene was based on a number of assumptions, human assumptions or human aspirations, that growth is good, that when there is a conflict, no matter how bad the local conflict is, no matter how bad the local conditions become, we are not going to leave, even if that means that we have to take what we need from our neighbors in order to make, stay in place. That civilization is about conflict and replacement. It's about who wins. It's about survival of the fittest. All of these non-Darwinian kinds of, of ideas and ultimately the notion that technology will save us from ourselves. Arms races are not Darwinian. You hear this all the time that arms races are an evolutionary phenomenon, it's built into us. This is not true. The reason that arms races are not Darwinian is because they are episodes of conflict without resolution. Conflict is part of evolution, but it is not part of survival. And we talked ourselves into believing that arms races were, were the way to go a very long time ago. So this phrase in Latin from the second century of the Common Era uh, translates to, therefore, he who desires peace should prepare for war. And this is what we've been doing to ourselves for 9,000 years, and we've been justifying it to ourselves in spite of all the evidence that it never works and never makes anything better except possibly in a short-term localized sense. So this means that the Anthropocene was never sustainable. From 9,000 years ago, humanity embarked on a path that was never going to be sustainable. And in our sense, sustainable means survivable. It's actually astonishing that we've survived to this point. That's only due to our, our extreme cleverness and large population size. But we can now go no further with business as usual and survive as a technological species. We see this from a small pandemic that crashed the global economy, a localized war that is going to put at up to 300 million people at risk of starvation in the next year. We simply cannot keep doing what we've been doing. So we want to issue what we call a declaration of human survival. If the issue is sustaining human existence, then we might want to adopt some evolutionary principles in what we do. And the policy foundation for this is embodied in what we call the four laws of biotics, which basically says human, for the zeroth law, the fundamental law, is that humanity may not harm the biosphere or allow it to be harmed. And that is the biosphere as a functioning system. The, sec the first law says that humanity may not harm any part of the biosphere unless that is required to maintain the integrity of the entire biosphere itself. The second law says that humanity can use any part of the biosphere in any way it wants to, so long as that doesn't conflict with the first two laws. And the fourth law is that humanity can protect its own existence within a biosphere so long as those activities don't conflict with the first three laws. So now there are three major elements that we talk about in the book. One is how do we interact with the rest of the biosphere under the four laws of biotics? And that involves creating evolutionary commons. That is, don't try to control nature, give biodiversity room to move around, and take care of itself to explore its own potential for survival. Encourage the exploration of evolutionary potential 
and the biosphere's inherent capacity to cope with change by changing. At the moment, only the Área de Conservación Guanacaste in northwest Costa Rica is set up as an evolutionary commons. That is the only conservation area on the entire planet that is suitable for allowing biodiversity to survive the Anthropocene. How do we interact with each other? That involves converting from the economics of growth to the economics of well-being. You can grow as much as possible. You can benefit personally as much as possible, so long as you do not interfere with the well-being of the greater whole. This is your personal aspirations have to be modified within the context of not endangering the survival of the entire species. We need to reduce population density, in particular, in climate insecure, overcrowded cities. And we need to engage in sustainable regrowth. Accommodating our institutions, that is recognizing that if we have networks of small circular economies, that is the solution to reducing population density in threatened cities, is to revitalize rural areas and create networks of cooperating small communities. That is going to require some sort of higher level institutional uh, management and, and uh, uh, communication. But that kind of accommodation is not going to be possible unless there is appropriate interaction between High, the higher institutions and the people who are being managed. We began building and abandoning, abandoning cities in response to climate change 12,500 years ago. And we have been at war with ourselves for more than 9,000 years. We've seen this movie before and we know how it always ends. So humanity now has two options. We can change our behavior now at enormous expense and survive or we can lose everything by 2050 or possibly by 2030, 2035, but certainly by 2050, and then try to rebuild. Now, the interesting thing about evolutionary principles is that the same principles hold whether you're trying to persist now with what you have sustainably or whether you're going to try to rebuild because humans have the capacity for conflict resolution. We have been a conflict with each other for 9,000 years, but we still maintain the capacity for conflict resolution. And that requires an interaction of familiarity, cooperation, and trust. And of those three, the weak point in humanity right now is trust. That is the place that, that, that is, a lack of trust is primarily the thing that's keeping us from, from uh, allowing ourselves to survive. It's not time to panic. We're very late in the game of, of trying to, to survive, but this is not the time for desperate heroics or giving up. It's a time to be pragmatic, creative, and persistent. Cope with the present, spend potential on the future, be more than provocative, be proactive, actually go for things. Now, evolution gives us hope even if we fail in this century. This particular diagram is, is a, a schematic of the, the five major mass extinctions that have occurred. And, and there are biologists now saying that we have created the sixth mass extinction and everything's going to disappear. Everything's terrible. Humanity's going to, to go away and the whole planet's going to die. But evolutionary history tells us that in the previous five mass extinctions, enough biodiversity was left for evolution to produce in a fairly rapid period of time, a, a new and vibrant biosphere. So there's an enormous amount of evolutionary capacity in the biosphere and in, huma in humanity, if we allow it to express itself. And so I end with this notion, what we lost in the fire, we will find in the ashes. So even if, as I'm afraid, I believe, because I'm old and cynical, humanity will not do the right thing in the next 30 years. 
and we will have to rebuild. But the reality is we have the capacity to rebuild. And some of the things that, that we're talking about in our book, hopefully, would be part of a, a rebuilding exercise that would, would put humanity on a different track than the one that got us where we are today. So thank you very much.